This is the true free thinker for the We Are Atheism project. So in keeping with this most recent of Richard Dawkins inspired atheist evangelical zeal movement, I thought to do a reading from the main atheism article uh, at creation.com forward slash atheism and we'll read the section entitled why atheism is chosen that'll give us a unique perspective there may be as many reasons that people choose atheism as there are individuals who make that choice these range from philosophy or science to emotion or rebellion and various combinations of such factors prominent Argentinian hyperrealism artist Helmut Dicht retells part of his upbringing. Until my 20s, I was an atheist. Although I felt the spiritual world, I used atheism as a reaction to a very difficult childhood. My mother died when I was 8 years old. Although my father was concerned with giving us a comfortable childhood, it was sad. Joe Orso, writing on the origin of belief, interviewed atheist Ira Glass who said I find that I don't seem to have a choice over whether or not I believe in God I simply find that I do not either you have faith or you don't either you believe or you don't so Orso states I was once talking with a Chinese friend she asked whether I believed in God I told her I did I returned the question and she said no when I and I asked her why not her father she explained had told her there was no God when she was a child she hadn't really thought about it much since then note carefully the words of Thomas Nagel who has a bachelor's in philosophy from Oxford and a PhD from Harvard he's the professor of philosophy and law university professor and Fiorella LaGuardia, Professor of Law. He specializes in political philosophy, ethics, epistemology, and philosophy of mind. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a fellow of the British Academy. And he has held fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. I want atheism to be true, and I am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. Consider the following words from Isaac Asimov, one of the most prolific scientific writers of the last century. I am an atheist out and out. It took me a long time to say it. I've been an atheist for years and years, but somehow I felt it was intellectually un unrespectable to say one was an atheist because it assumed knowledge that one didn't have. Somehow it was better to say one was a humanist or an agnostic. I finally decided that I'm a creature of emotion as well as of reason. Emotionally, I am an atheist. I don't have the evidence to prove God doesn't exist, but I so strongly suspect he doesn't that I don't want to waste my time. Gary Wolf, contributing editor to Wired magazine, includes himself in the following description. We lax agnostics. We non-committal non-believers. We vague deists who would be embarrassed to defend antique absurdities like the virgin birth or the notion that Mary rose to heaven without dying or any other blatant myth. He wrote, at dinner parties or over drinks, I ask people to declare themselves. Who here's an atheist, I ask. Usually the first response is silent, silence, accompanied by glances all around in hopes that somebody else will speak first. Then, after a moment, somebody does. Almost always a man, almost always with a defiant smile and a tone of enthusiasm. He says happily, I am. But 
It is the next comment that is telling. Somebody turns to him and says, you would be. Why? Because you enjoy, let us say, uh, irritating people. Well, that's true. This type of conversation takes place not in central Ohio, where I was born, or in Utah, where I was a teenager, but on the West Coast among technical and scientific people, possibly the social group that is least likely among all Americans to be religious. Thus, we find various motivating factors which lead to atheism and have absolutely nothing to do with science or intellect. Paul Witz, professor of psychology at the New York University, made a fascinating study of the lives of some of the most influential atheists. In his book, Faith of the Fatherless, The Psychology of Atheism, he concluded that these persons rejected God because they rejected their own fathers. This was due to their poor relationships with their fathers, or due to their father's absence, or due to their rebellion against their fathers. Along this line of research, it would be interesting to consider the effect that the death of friends and family has had on the rejection of God. From Charles Darwin to Ted Turner, the death of friends and family has played a part. Gary Wolf noted, Contrary to myth, Darwin did not become an atheist because of evolution. Instead, his growing resistance to Christianity came from his moral criticism of 19th century doctrine compounded by the tragedy of his daughter's death. The Associated Press reported on an interview with Ted Turner published in the New Yorker. CNN founder Ted Turner was suicidal after the breakup of his marriage to Jane Fonda and his loss of control of Turner Broadcasting. His marriage to Fonda broke up partly because of her decision to become a practicing Christian. Turner is a strident non-believer. Having lost his faith after his sister, Mary Jane, died of a painful disease called systemic lupus erythematosus. I was taught that God was love and God was powerful, Turner said, and I couldn't understand how someone so innocent could be made to, or allowed to suffer so. He told the New Yorker his father was often drunk, beat him, and sent him to military school and committed suicide when Turner t was 24 years of age. Tony's, Tony Snow was the White House press secretary in 2006-2007 and was a Christian. Died of cancer in July 2008. He wrote an essay entitled, Cancer's Unexpected Blessing. Consider, in contrast, how a God-centered person dealt with his own impending death. We shouldn't spend too much time trying to answer the why questions. Why me? Why must people suffer? Why can't someone else get sick? We can't answer such things. And the questions themselves often are designed more to express our anguish than to solicit an answer. The natural reaction is to turn to God and ask him to serve as a cosmic Santa. Dear God, make it all go away. Make everything simpler. But another voice whispers, You have been called. Your quandary has drawn you closer to God, closer to those you love, closer to the issues that matter, and has dragged into insignificance the banal concerns that occupy our normal time. There is another kind of response, although usually short-lived, an inexplicable shudder of excitement, as if a clarifying moment of calamity has swept away everything trivial and tiny and placed before us the challenge of important questions. Even though God doesn't promise us tomorrow, he does promise us eternity. This is love of a very special order, but so is the ability to sit back and appreciate the wonder of every created thing. The mere thought of death somehow makes every blessing vivid, every happiness more luminous and intense. We may not know how our contest with sickness will end, but we have felt 
the ineluctable touch of God. In contrast, consider the words of atheist William Provine, professor of history of science at Cornell University. Let me summarize my view on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear, and I must say that they, these are basically Darwin's views. There are no gods, no purposive forces of any kind, no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to be completely dead. That's just all. That's going to be the end of me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for human beings either. The question is, can atheistic humanism offer us very much? Well, sure, it can give you intellectual satisfaction, and I'm a heck of a lot more intellectually satisfied now that I don't have to cling to the fairy tales that I believed when I was a kid. So life may have no ultimate meaning, but I sure think it can have lots of proximate meaning. With regards to his own cancer, a brain tumor, Provine has stated that he would shoot himself in the head if his brain tumor returned. Apparently, one less bioorganism is irrelevant in an absolutely materialistic world. So that's the end of the reading, but I thought that uh, another statement should be added from the cosmologist Lawrence Krauss, who states, I personally wouldn't call myself an atheist because I don't presume to claim there's no God. If anything, I declare myself an anti-theist because I say with absolute certainty there is no God. But what I would say is I'd much rather prefer to live in a universe without one. We also have the case of John Loftus, and I kid you not, he says this, he lays it out in his book. He claims that after having been a Christian and into apologetics and everything, which gives him some kind of credibility or argument from authority, he says he wanted to commit adultery. God considers adultery to be a sin. God did not stop him from committing adultery, so he committed adultery. Therefore, God doesn't exist. This is really and actually his argument against God's existence. And then you have Lewis Wolpert, who basically just lays it out this way. When he was a teenager, he couldn't find his cricket bat, and he prayed to God that God would help him find his cricket bat. Well, he didn't find his cricket bat. Therefore, God doesn't exist. I kid you not, these are real-life arguments from atheists. I don't like getting weed in the grind.